Silvius Traders Lounge welcomes you to yet another webinar where we learn, trade and profit. We shall be giving you trading insights on technical analysis, fundamental analysis, risk management and trading psychology. Today's guest is Tracy Schuchart and our theme is Understanding the Autonomy of Trading Oil. for tuning in to today's webinar. We're honored to have Tracy. Tracy Schuchart manages an energy and commodities portfolio for a family office. She has also recently joined hedge fund telemetry as the energy and basic materials sectors analyst. Hedge fund telemetry is a specialized research and services group with a focus on market sentiment, macro weekly and daily insights, sector rotations and long and short trade ideas. With access to customized research, we cover domestic and international markets. Tracy started her career in finance at the Chicago Board of Trade. There, she started as a futures options and managed futures broker before moving on to managing a trading desk on the trade floor, where her firm strategized and executed on behalf of large hedge funds, global banks in energy, agriculture, softs, livestock, metals, FX futures, bonds, and federal funds markets. Tracy graduated with honors from the University of Southern California. She holds a degree in political science with an emphasis on comparative politics. There's a two week trial offer available for her analysis at www.hedgefundtelemetry.com or www.hedgefundtelemetry.com slash join energy sector slash full stop. So welcome, uh, Tracy. It's an honor to see you and to have you back on the lounge. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so you can start by just telling us about your trading journey, uh, starting out at the Chicago Board of Trade. And then when you transitioned and specialized on oil trading, how did that work for you? And then also the experience you got working with JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Um, how has that affected your independent professional trading? Yeah, well, um, I started, you know, I started the Board of Trade and really um, when I started, there were a lot of women in the industry um, and I wanted a job there. So really, I just knocked on doors and took literally the only job that I could get. <laughs> so my very first job was um, at a firm that was just like you see in the movies. It was like a boiler room. I don't know where you just call people, call people, call people, you know, 400 times a day. You want to put money in with options. <laughs> so that's really how I started. Um, and then I kind of moved up from there to uh, better brokerage. Um, then I moved on to manage futures, which is a little bit more uh, kind of serious. Um, and because I was working at the board of trade, um, the, the trade floor was, you know, in that building. So I got to know a lot of the traders just from being in that building. And um, one of the traders asked me to come down and start clerking for him. Um, and so I did that and then worked my way up to uh, managing the trade desk there. And um, it was really exciting. I mean, it's just like you see in the movies. I mean, it was you know, all the hand signs and people yelling and um, it was a great experience. Unfortunately, I was there kind of very at the very end, you know, um, but, um, but it was a really good time. And uh, then, you know, I, it really, we were a, an execution broker. So, um, you know, we would have hedge funds and this was kind of, you know, just as, you um, the electronic markets were getting started. So a lot of them still called their orders down to the trade floor, especially for options. Um, so we would literally just take their order and execute for them or help them uh, form kind of a trade strategy if they wanted to say, you know, I want to, you know, long corn, but hedge it this way. So uh, we would either help them with trades or we just ex executed for them. Um, so, I mean, it was really exciting. I got to meet a lot of people, uh, a lot of people I still talk to, um, met a ton of people in the industry. Um, so that's really kind of, really just kind of my progression through 
um, through that. And then I kind of went out on my own uh, for a bit. I, well, I started at a prop firm for a little bit, um, which was not exactly for me, but you know, I, there are a lot of good things um, about, about the prop industry. You know, I, learned a, I learned a lot there and then um, just went out on my own. Um, and really my interest in uh, the oil industry really started with my very first job um, being a broker because my first client um, was a truck driver actually in Kansas and he was using options to hedge his fuel usage, right? Um, so he was trading oil a lot and our very, our very first trade was a huge winner. And so I just really loved the, the oil market after that and kind of fit in with my, my education background, studying politics. I studied a lot of, you know, uh, about, you know, the Middle East and things like that. So it was already, I was already kind of familiar with, um, with, with the oil markets and, um, and that's kind of how that started. <laughs> All right. Um, so who are like, what can you tell us about your, how the oil market works briefly and then who are the main participants currently? Well, so, I mean, how the oil market works, there's, you know, there's two basic benchmarks that trade, right? You have the Brent contract and that's most, mostly a financial contract. Um, it's a, not a deliverable contract. So in that market, you'll have a lot of people that are hedging um, and things of that nature because it's a financial product. On the other side, we have WTI markets through CME, um, and that's actually a physically deliverable contract. Um, so they both, you know, I mean, you both see them move together, right? They rise and fall kind of together, but they're, how they're traded is, is completely different. All right, like, so what's the primary difference between WTI and Brent for people who are new into trading oil? So Brent is, besides being a financial contract, that's the heavier sour crude. So that market represents, um, uh, you know, the North Sea. It's really a North Sea oil contract that is, contains five fields. Um, but, you know, you'll have, because uh, like the Middle East um, and places like that will have, they often use that contract to hedge because they have some the heavier crudes. Um, on the other side, on WTI, that's West Texas Intermediate. It's a little light crude contract. Um, and on that side, you'll see, uh, you know, participants that are more geared towards the light markets, um, you know, uh, like Nigeria, uh, you know, that have uh, the very lighter grades that will be more involved in that market. All right, cool. So when you're trading oil, um, what data do you normally look at before you start maybe your trading day that people can go look up? Right yeah, so I, I mean, first I look at Twitter. <laughs> um, you know, I follow all the, the news, you know, all the oil journalists, all the, the news sites and things like that. I mean, I, I probably follow more news than I do actual people. Um, and so I always look at Twitter first thing, you know, cause you wanna know, you know, I don't know, did something happen somewhere in the world? Did a pipeline break? You know, did somebody get bombed? <laughs> yeah, I mean, all sorts of things. So first my day starts at looking at news, you know, did, you know for, for whatever reason that I think would affect the oil markets. Um, and then really, um, uh, you know, I go look at my charts. I start with a four hour chart um, and then one hour chart and then a five minute chart. I really work my way down, but I have, you know, I start my week by looking at monthly, weekly, daily, like so I want a picture, like a funnel, right? You want to look at the biggest picture first so you can kind of see where the market is um, and where, what direction it may be going. Cause I see a lot of new traders. They're in like a five minute chart. And, uh, you know, to really get a scope of what the oil market's doing, you really need to back out time, time wise, you know, because a 10 cent move looks huge on, you know, a five minute chart. But if you're looking at a four hour chart or a daily chart, 
um, you know, that moves not that big. All right, so maybe now you can take us through like an example of your live chat analysis on your trading approach. Um, um, sure, I mean, I'll show you some, I mean, a basic, just a basic setup of mine. I have a ton of uh, charts, but um, let's see. I just, the let's see, I can just do like a share screen. All right, so this is just basically, um, and I know I have this, I, ha I have, oops. That's NASDAQ. We'll change this. It's I use the same setup for everything. All right. Um, for everything I trade. Sorry. All right. So um, I use, why didn't that change? All right. So I have first, I have my hourly chart. I have a five minute chart um, in front of me if I'm day trading. Um, and then I have a four hour chart over here. Um, and really, I mean, you can add a bunch of indicators if you want. Um, I find really less is more. Sometimes I'll put an SMA or something like that on it. But really, you know, what I'm looking at, and this is just the easiest, um, I, I think a, like a good way to start, like a very, you know, clear, easy way is to use vo these volume profiles because you want to see, you know, where in this market, you know, where has it been traded the most, right? This is where it's been traded the most. And you'll see like this morning, right? It came down. This is just a five minute chart. This would be an interday chart. It came down and you can see this actually coincides with, you know, with this area right here on the hourly chart as well. It comes down it's kind of rejected out of there and it bounces back up to um, to uh, to a, a, an area where it, the price has been accepted more, right? Say, and, you know, the same thing happened on the five minute chart this morning, came down, was, didn't, couldn't get back into this zone down here. So we flipped right back up and it's trading at POC right now, which is point of control. And if we look at, the four hour chart, same thing happened there. We came down, it was not accepted into the next volume node down. Um, so we bounce right back up into the point of control there into the zone that it's been comfortably trading in. Um, so that's really, you know, I would suggest, you know, instead of using a bazillion indicators and things like that, this is, to me, the easiest way to kind of grasp where, where is the market trading and where do I think that it's going to trade, right? Because the market always likes to, you know, you'll see where, um, push this in, you know, the market attempted to come down here um, somewhere at some point um, and um, it was swiftly, you know, rejected. You have this long tail, like, market didn't like any of these prices and it came back up to where it's been comfortably trading and they're kind of supply and demand zones you can look at it that way if that i hope that makes sense <laughs> yeah, maybe you can explain more on how that works the supply and demand zones in your chat yeah so it's just kind of where um here let's Let's go to just like one chart. We'll go to the hourly chart, right? Okay. Um, so you can see, how do I move this thing? All right, so you can see, um, you know, the market came down here. It's, there's, there's no, there just was no real supply right, right down here. Um, so the market comes back up to where it's more traded and where, where it's, mostly traded is where you can see this right, right where this area has been, you know, bouncing around it. And this is where the volume is. So this has been the accepted area for a while. Every time we get down here, the volume gets thinner. It's can't, it's not really accepted. And we keep getting rejected right back up to its comfortable trading area. Now, when you have a big days that swing, you know, this could, um, obviously this could happen. This isn't a long enough term chart, but um, you know, when you find areas that, and I, I have these marked, but you can't see them on the volume profile because this chart's not long enough, but I mark each area 
where there are big volume nodes. So I know above and below where this market has been trading. Um, and I kind of just marked them off, you know, just like this. I didn't do this today, but I would mark 21 or 41.15 and I would work below right here at 39.36. Um, and I would keep those marked on my chart just like I did when it was trading higher. And I literally leave them on my chart all the time. You can see I've marked them from all the way back last year when market, the market was trading over 50. All right, and then is it the same thing with when you're trading oil, the more the volume, the more the opportunities for a trader to cash in? Is, is it the same thing when you're doing a volume profiling? But I mean, this is kind of where this is, this is where I would, I think the market would go. So what, you know, if I was looking at this, and I see this dip all the way down to 3663, right, which was close enough to my 3631 that I had down here, this is the area that I would start, I noticed that there's not a lot of trading down here, the market you know, doesn't really like it down here. So this is be the area that I would start looking to take a long to go back up here. Obviously you would trade with a stop because um, if there was a volume node below, um, and if we change this to, if you change this to a longer term chart, you can see there are volume nodes below. So this area has been holding quite nicely, right? So at, once it gets down here, I would trade the long side. Every time it came down here, I would trade the long side. And then I would have a stop just below that because you know it could come back down and start trading in, in this area. But this area has been a really comfortable trading area for months now. Um, so that's kind of where I would look for opportunities to trade. And the same on top, right? You could look for areas and you know this, this 42 zone, um, you know, to take a short trade. All right, I think we will look at the questions from the participants. Are you, if you're done with the presentation, but- Yes, absolutely. I mean, I hope that makes sense to everybody. <laughs> so I welcome my co-host Dennis <clears throat> to take us through the Q&A. Um, one question I have, Tracy, is what is the correlation between oil and other markets, for example, currencies and, and um, other commodity markets? Yeah, that's a very good question. So what I look at, um, you know, uh, first, WTI is very correlated to CAD, to the Canadian dollar, um, because it's a commodity currency. Um, there's, you know, there, there's lots of, there's oil there. There's a lot of oil there. They trade with the United States. Um, most of their oil comes to the United States. So um, that's, and they have a lot of mining there too, as far as gold and um, other metals. Um, so it's definitely a commodity currency um, and that correlates. And then on the other side with Brent, um, you would have uh, the Norwegian um, kroner, N-O-K. So you'd have NOK uh, correlates with that market because, um, because of uh, their, their North Sea um, contracts and because of the drilling and where they are in their area. So those two are, are the commodity currencies that correlates with the oil markets. Um, and then I also look at, I mean, particularly um, I look at uh, because the Fed is so involved the central banks right now are so involved in, uh, in the markets as far as um, that inflation, uh, deflation trade, right? Um, so right now, what I'm looking at is um, even though we've got a lot of kind of fundamental reasons that are a little bit against the market right now, especially with new shutdowns and things like that, the thing is, is that right now, the central banks are screaming, we want inflation, we want inflation, we want inflation. And so you see this trading in the markets, you see the tips markets, um, uh, and everybody's piling into the tips market. So everybody's playing this inflation trade right now. And um, the best hedge against inflation are gold and, uh, the, and crude oil. So right now, I, you're going to have to be hard pressed to really get a huge dive in the crude oil market. 
So those are just kind of the, some of the fundamental things that I look at um, that are correlated to other markets that are correlated to say the bond market and the US treasury market and things like of that nature. And um, one of the members of the audience is asking, Barack, um, do you think uh, the upcoming elections will have any effect on the oil market? Basically. That's a very good question. And I, <laughs> um, I think that, well, obviously, if it's, um, if it's a Trump win, right, the regime will stay the same. Um, which is pro oil, um, and with uh, should Biden win? Should we have a, a kind of a policy change there? In reality, I don't think that that would be as negative huh? of, of a market that people <laughs> that people yeah, think like that it would be. Is there somebody talking? <laughs> Sorry about, about that. that. We want to mute the participants. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so I don't think that it would be, but he's actually, um, you know, he was in office when we first, when they first opened up the United States to um, be able to export. He was, uh, you know, uh, was in the administration when uh, we had the Arctic, uh, when we had first Arctic drilling permits. So he's really not as anti-oil as say most of the other Democrats. Right. He's more centrist. So I don't think that, you know, I think that he's talking about maybe, um, you know, not uh, securing permits on federal lands. But, you know, most companies have preemptively already secured permits and things of that nature that they need to ahead of the election, um, you know, just in case. So I don't think it will be as bad for the oil market as people think. And of course, you know, I think that, you know, obviously that would help the renewable market as well, right? So all in the energy sector. So I, do, I think as a whole, the energy sector will not, uh, you know, take a hit as much as people think, in my opinion. Um, the oil, the, basically the WTI has been trading in quite a tight range for a while now, do you see any geopolitical developments that will make uh, prices break out of that range going forward to the future? Make Basically, what, what, what does your crystal ball say about? <laughs> Um, okay, so my crystal ball says in the medium term, I think we are we have been stuck in this range right since June fourth, yeah. June sixth, um, which you know, as oil traders, you know, it's not really a fun market to trade right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's you know, I have to look at it as in um, OPEC kind of you know stepped in to kind of you know stabilize the oil market, and I kind of say they did a good job, maybe too good of a job if you're a, if you're an oil trader. <laughs> Um, but I think going forward, you know, we are, you know, there are some things working against the oil markets right now, right? You have perhaps new lockdowns again. Um, this is the soft season a little bit. Um, but I really, you know, what I foresee in the future, looking out to, um, you know, Q, Q1 and beyond next year is we, I'm very bullish the oil market for the first time since 2014. <laughs> very first time. Um, and I say that because you have so much lack of capex, right? Because companies are trying to, they don't want to drill anymore. They're trying to save money. They're trying to save share, shareholders. I mean, if you look at the energy sector on uh, the, the indice, the world indices, I mean, they, you know, they've gone from 20% to, to, you know, 2% of the weighting. Um, so that you've had a lot of capex cuts. Um, you have OPEC cuts, um, you know, we are expected to see the market increase, um, you know, next year, uh, about 6 million barrels per day. Um, so I think that we're going to, going to see a supply crunch is what, you know, first, first we had demand destruction happen with this pandemic and everything. So now I think we're going to have a, a, a supply problem on the opposite side just going into next year. So I'm bullish. So I'm looking for the market at some point uh, to break out of this range. So personally, you know, I keep playing the long side of this market. Um, although, you know, we may be stuck here for another couple of months. Hopefully not, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. 
And um, at the moment, the role that China is playing, um, currently right now, it's the second largest consumer of oil um, in the world. Do you see also that playing quite a big role in enabling uh, prices uh, to surge? Uh, basically, because right now, China is at least easing um, all the restrictions to do with COVID-19, the spread of COVID-19. Right. So, um, I mean, China's, you know, I call them the buyer of last resort. I mean, they stock, they buy a ton of oil. If you need to get your oil mark, oil sold, you know, most people go to China first. Um, you know, their biggest suppliers are Russia and Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, obviously, because of logistics, it's just closer. Um, you know, but they are starting to buy more from, from the United States. Um, so that market is definitely one to, to keep an eye on, right? If you ever start seeing them, they say they decide to stop stockpiling or, um, you know, you see their orders go down, but, um, but that's definitely always kind of a market to, to, to keep an eye on. Um, so far, you know, it looks, you know, the way they've handled the virus, I don't think that they're going to have a shutdown like they did you know, initially. Um, so, and then I always look towards, you know, in, in, in December, they, um, that's when they put all their, they give all their, uh, their uh, uh, teapots, they give them how much they can buy for the next year. Um, so you always look at those December numbers um, and see, you know, are they buying more? Are they buying less? Do they, you know, kind of, and they increase those during the year, but December is kind of when um, you kind of get the numbers and kind of get a feel for what their buying capacity will be into the next year. Okay, thank you, Tracy. And one more thing, um, fracking. Basically, what's, what will be the long-term impact of fracking on the supply of oil uh, in the global market, especially the United States that is quite um, involved in, in fracking. Yeah, well, I mean, as far as fracking is concerned in, in, in the United States, you know, the height of the market was about 13.5 million barrels. And I don't think you're probably not going to see that ever again, or, or at least not, you know, not again soon because of all the shutdowns, because you know of all the mergers and acquisitions in in the industry, um, because of all the production that was shut down. Um, you know, so trying to get that fracking is it, the wells constantly have to be supplied, right? It's not like deep water where you know um, the project timeline is seven to ten years, and then you know you then you have like 20 years worth of supply. Um, fracking is, you know, those wells um, have decline rates, right? They only produce so much. So you have to keep, uh, you have to keep drilling wells, drilling wells to keep that supply up. And because all of that stopped, um, we just don't have the supply. There's just not the supply going into the future. And it would be probably, um, you know, won't get up to that speed for, for, for quite a few years. So that's another reason that I'm also bullish is because all of that, you know, um, all of that is coming off the market as well, probably permanently or semi-permanently. <laughs> and um, Barack, once Barack is saying, um, he read somewhere, I hope not zero hedge, that <laughs> Russia... <laughs> <laughs> that Russia was uh, uh, intentionally manipulating prices a few months ago in order to undermine the US fracking no. industries and energy dominance. And he would like to hear your opinion on that. So. No, I do not believe that has happened. I've consistently said that on Twitter. I've consistently written about it. Mm -hmm. No, that is not the case. Um, you know, and most oil analysts would agree with me there. Um, it's, you know, was a rumor going around, but that's just, that's really not the case. I, I, you know, everything a few months ago just unfortunately happened all at once. You know, Russia had a disagreement with Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia turned on the taps right when we have a pandemic and everybody shut down. So it was just, you know, it was just an unfortunate set of events that all happened at at the same time that sent, you know, oil spir spiraling, but it was not to 
get shell out of the market. Okay, so folks, <laughs> um, bullish long term on oil. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Do, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, no more questions. All right. Uh, Tracy, I think you can show us how you manage your stocks, your risk, and then we can see what we have from the audience. Okay. Um, so, I mean, as far as, you know, it stops concerned, wait, oh, I got to go back to sharing. Yeah. So, okay, so I mean, really, as far as stops concerned, it really depends on your risk tolerance and, uh, you know, of that nature. Um, you know, what, you know, if I'm doing a swing trade, per se, then I would have, you know, I have a bigger stop, right? But you have to, um, you know, it's hard to say, use this stop or use that stop because it's really I don't know what people's account sizes are I don't know what their risk tolerance is I can just tell you, you know if I'm doing a swing trade I'll probably have you know a dollar stop you know if I'm looking for a large move in the market um, if I'm looking for a smaller move in the market you know I'll usually give it you know 50 cents or 50 cents or so um, but it really just depends you know because it would be if I you know I have this area marked, right? If I go 50 cents under this, you know, that's going into, you know, an area I don't really want to be. So, you know, 50 cents, 75 cents, something like that. But really, you have to, it's really about, you know, again, it's really about your risk tolerance and, and your style of trading. You know, a lot of people um, scalp trade, right? And so they probably want a lot smaller, smaller kind of uh, stop. So um, again, it's really what your risk tolerance is. It's it's really just kind of, you know, like I said, knowing these areas and where oil is likely to trade or not, not to trade. All right. I think, uh, like you said, you're very active on Twitter. So um, you can share where people can go to find maybe your analysis online or website mention and you, maybe your Twitter handle before we start the conclusion, basically. That was a good presentation. Okay. Stop share. <laughs> okay, so I'm back. Um, so yes, all right. So I am now working with hedge fund tele telemetry. There is a two week free trial. Um, I write every weekend. I write a major report on what I'm looking at in the week ahead, what happened in the week behind. Um, then um, every Wednesday, I always write a report on uh, the, the oil inventories. Um, and then in between, um, you know, if I see something, then I also put out trade recommendations on um, things of that nature, not just, not just oil, there's oil equities as well. Um, so if you want to go sign up for that, I sign up for the two week free trial. All my prior notes are there too. So you can see what I've written in the past. Um, and, you know, I, I would love for everybody to at least, you know, try it out and kind of see what I have to say. Um, and if anything big ever comes in the market, comes up in the market, obviously, you know, I, I'll write something up um, with that as well. And it's not only oil, but the material sector as well. So um, base metals, lumber, things like that. All right, and then there's a um, question coming in. Uh, can we rely on WTI in the analysis of the peso MXN? Can we rely on? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? So you cut um, out a little bit. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So there's a question from Asidi. He's asking, can we rely on WTI in analysis of the peso MXN? Uh, peso. Actually, uh, the, the the peso is actually more correlated, believe it or not, to um, S and P five hundred to the American U S indices. Um, so I actually use that that pair U S um, you know U S M X N. I use that really as a gauge for the for the indices rather than the the, the oil markets. Mm, all right. So I hope that answers your question, Asidi. We're getting more questions and there's Noel is asking, how do you insert the volume profile on the chat? Um, so it depends on what platform you're using, but it should be an indicator there. I don't know, just go under somewhere where your indicators are. Um, and there should be, I mean, most platforms, 
that I haven't seen a platform yet that doesn't have one. And it's usually just called volume profile. Um, and so, and uh, some platforms also have TPO, which is, uh, so kind of look for, for that indicator on, on your charts. Um, I'm certain you have it. If your platform doesn't have it, then you can maybe look online and see if there's a way to import that particular indicator. All right, so, and then there's one last question. What's the current state of the oil price war or did it end a long time ago? What is the current state of the oil price war? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, I think the oil market's pretty stabilized right now. So, um, you know, I think all of the OPEC, non-OPEC, um, you know, pretty much everybody's come together right now. This is, a, you know, very first time where people aren't trying to, you know, outproduce one another for, for market share right now. It's kind of a very nice global coordinated effort um, to, uh, you know, to stabilize the market. And, you know, obviously, you know, some production and things like that have come offline just because they've had to because of circumstance. Um, but I mean, there's not, I mean, right now, I think it's a pretty stable time in, in the market for the first time. I it probably won't last. I can't guarantee it lasts, but. <laughs> I hope that uh, stability would um, continue um, encouraging this chopping chop environment um, because most of us want, want to see yeah. oil pumping, you know. <laughs> I think it will break out, right? Because the more the market consolidates, I think the more the breakout is has more energy to it. Right? So when it breaks out, it'll probably break out really hard. Yeah, I hope we'll be there to catch it. And I hope you guys will also be following Tracy on Twitter in order to catch that particular moment when the breakout happens. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, from our first interview, you mentioned a few book recommendations. Maybe you can tell us your takeaways from these books, and then maybe if you have upgraded your library, you can tell us more. So, so there's this, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so there's this book um, called Mind Over Markets: Power Trading with Market Generated Information by James F. Dalton, and then there is Market Profile Devised by J. P. Taft. Steedle Mayer. Steedle Mayer, yeah. So, I mean, if you, and market profile is kind of what I was talking about earlier, right? So uh, that is, I definitely recommend that book, um, Steedle Mayer's book on market profile. He actually was the godfather of, he pretty much discovered it, you know, <laughs> in the 80s. Um, and so, um, you know, definitely recommend that book. Dalton's book is good as well. It kind of expands on market profile, but really if you want a foundation, you probably want Steedle Meyer's book. Um, and then I would also suggest another book if you're new to the oil industry and you kind of want to know a lot about the fundamentals and um, more of the background and things of that nature, then I would get Oil 101 by Morgan Downey. Um, you know, that, that book is fantastic for a foundation. So you kind of understand all the things that are going on in the oil market and the players and um, you know the different types of oil and where they come from and, and things of that nature. All right, cool. So maybe your last parting shot and then I can ask Dennis to also send his last remarks before we wind up. Uh, well, uh, my, I would just say, please sign up for my analysis, um, get oil 101 and um, hang with it. This market will break out soon, one way or the other. <laughs> and really, right. I mean, fo follow me on Twitter. I provide a lot of information on, you know, I provide a lot of free information every day on Twitter on the oil markets. And I always alert the market when, you know, something big happens right away. All right. So we really thank you, Tracy, for making time on short notice to train us basically on your trading approach on oil. We'd love to have you again in the future if your time allows. And we're, we're super grateful. So 
Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me on. I super appreciate it. All right. We'll send you the link when, when the editing is done. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks guys for tuning in and sticking with us to the end. We hope you have learned something new. I would like to appreciate Scope Markets for sponsoring this webinar. Remember, you can open a live trading account with Scope Markets and apply the lessons shared by the guest in this webinar to your trading. Many thanks to our guests for speaking to us. We'll be open to have you in the future. Till next time, goodbye.